this is part two of our vocal production class audio and yeah let's talk about how you record and mix and create vocals so if you're here last week i'll do a little recap for those who weren't but if you're here last week you notice we talked about three main elements talent space and tools and how you work with each one of these and we also talked about just the general principles behind recording technology and the way sound works and how it's really just vibrations in the air kind of like the way if you stick your finger in a bowl of water and it creates ripples that's the way sound works sound are ripples vibrations that move through the air and they travel to our ears our ears have little tiny hairs in them that detect this vibration and that gets transformed into uh, an electrical signal in our brains that get interpreted as sound and hearing by and recording technology works pretty much the same way microphones like what you're seeing pictured there have a diaphragm in the capsule that moves kind of like the little hairs in our ears it detects vibrations transforms them into an electrical signal that the rest of the mic will send to a preamp or some other piece of gear so that you can use that signal and that's essentially how recording technology works and voice talent whether you're a voice talent yourself or you work with voice talent I talked about some things you can do to get the most out of performances first being just training and resources don't be afraid to take lessons don't be afraid to reach out to programs in your area that might have a, a music program, something like a, like a local church or something that, that you might uh, pick up some tips and some useful knowledge, some practice, some good vocal info. And uh, know your range, know what your lowest capable note is, your highest capable note, and what your comfortable range in between those are. That's very useful when you're going to sessions and stuff. Let people know that so they don't have to worry about transposing a song for you on the fly and before you do any sort of performance always do some sort of warm-up or whatever your routine is whether it's just drinking like a warm liquid tea, hot tea with honey or something that's going to help relax your throat try to avoid any sort of cold liquids or anything that's going to hinder it and uh, yeah that's pretty much a wrap-up of what we uh, went over with voice talent now recording space uh, we talked about whether you're using a uh, a room, a booth, a closet, whatever you are planning on using. Talked about considerations for getting the most out of that space. Things like air conditioning or other noise you got to deal with and how to treat the room with things like wall foam, other diffusion material that can help you out with, with deadening the room so that you so that you don't have to deal with things like reverberation or the sound of the room things like that yeah and then we talked about just microphones uh the two major kind of microphones you deal with dynamic and uh, condenser microphones and the easiest way to think of these are either stage or studio microphones dynamic microphones are typically used on stage because they're not t they're not super sensitive they're not going to pick up a whole lot of noise around them. they're just ma mainly going to pick up the person that's singing into it or the instrument that's being played into it the sort of focus part of that whereas condenser mics are made to pick up as much as possible they are uh, very sensitive and uh, pick up a lot more information you can use one versus the other for stage or studio it's just an easier way i think about it when you're in the studio you're going to be in a more controlled environment where you can eliminate other noises so a condenser might be more useful in that situation but you can use either one for either application and then we talked about the other uh, factors when uh, you're looking into a microphone pretty much every microphone is uh, designed with at least partially with vocals in mind so it's not hard to find a vocal mic but there are a lot of parameters and factors to them to consider and then also worth mentioning the difference between xlr and usb microphones xlrs are pretty much just analog uh, pieces of gear it's just the microphone itself that you plug into a preamp that gives it its, its signal boost and signal shaping, whereas a USB microphone is going to be a more all-in-one package. It's going to be a, a microphone plus a preamp plus an interface that uh, sends a signal into your computer via that USB connection. So that's an important thing to know about microphones. We also talked about preamps and other uh, things in your vocal chain and how the preamp is used to boost and shape the signal. Different kinds of preamps do different things. And uh, you don't always need something like a compressor or an EQ or extra dynamics processing in your signal path but sometimes it can be useful and there are just kind of more preferable situations to do that versus less preferable ones but most of us are probably using like a, a preamp computer interface all in one and so we don't 
really think about it as separate devices, but they are different components. And it's important to know that the preamp is powering the mic, shaping the signal, boosting it versus the computer interface that is converting that analog signal into a digital signal to get it into your computer. And then anything coming out of your computer, you want to play through your monitors that are connected to the interface or headphones. It has to convert that digital signal back into the analog signal to do that. And then we finished up just talking about general computer stuff, since that's what most of us are using, computer hardware with old, whether you're using an old style USB interface or one of the newer formats uh, or even something really old uh, like Firewire that I'm still using. There are a lot of differences or there were a lot of differences in the way you could connect your digital hardware to your computer. Software wise, you've got uh, DAWs, digital audio workstations, that's stuff like Pro Tools, Ableton Live, Cubase, FL Studio, which is kind of a full fledged multi-track and recording interface but you don't have to use something you know so elaborate you can just use a simple two-track editor something like audacity is uh, fine for recording vocals i know a lot of voice actors that do their auditions and such uh, within that plugins we talked about some of the vocal plugins you can get there's a ton out there my favorite is uh, isotope nectar just because it does pretty much everything you need under one roof so it gives you a lot of different processors in one. And uh, you don't even have to use a computer at all. You can use your phone or some other handheld device that you can make use of to record uh, different vocals and such. So yeah, that's kind of what we talked about last time. Before I move on to the next part, does anyone have any questions or anything you want me to go over before we start part two of this class? Okay. So part two, if part one was the players and the different elements that come into play for vocal production, part two is going to be the method and that what do you do with those elements once you have them? And this can be divided into three different stages, capture, compile, and polish. And we're going to go over each one of those and uh, the different things you do with each, each one of those. So first thing is if we're talking about recording, any type of recording, one of the most important factors that comes into play is your signal path. The signal path is the sort of trail that your signal follows from its source into the microphone, into every other little piece of gear, every other device and component until it gets to its final recording destination where it actually gets captured onto disc or onto tape if you're using an older method. This is important because every little piece of gear, whether you intend it to or not, can affect that signal. And whenever you encounter problems in recording, you know, when you have noise in your line or something's too loud or something's too quiet or something else is happening in the signal that you don't want to happen, you've got to trace that back and find exactly where the problem is and adjust it there. That's why it's so important to know your signal path. It is literally the assembly line of your audio work. If you're looking on screen right now, there's a nice little hand-drawn diagram of the signal path that Sylvia Massey, a Grammy award-winning uh, producer, that was her signal path for recording the uh, base of Tool's debut record, Undertow. That's how she recorded the bass, split the signal of the countryman, ran one signal directly into the board, ran another one into an amplifier where she mic'd it, summed it all into a couple of compressors and then ran it into a tape. That's a signal path. And uh, your signal path is going to be valid for everything you record. Even if it's something you just plug a microphone in and record your voice with just one device into another, there's going to be a lot of little things in between that you need to be aware of. And so we're going to talk about those things. With uh, any recording situation, your signal starts with your talent in the space you're recording them in. So if you're recording a singer, that's where it starts, your singer's voice in the space you're recording them in. It's, and it's important to know this because if you start with a less than ideal source, don't expect your, your, your gear further down the chain to necessarily be able to fix the problems with that source. Like there are some things you can do, noise reduction and EQing and things like that, but the old phrase, you can't polish a turd, that comes into play here. So just be aware that gear is not the end-all solution to everything. If you want to have good results, you have to start with a good source in a good space. Yep, so moving on to the next um, part of the signal path, that is um, gonna be your microphone, whatever your microphone uh, that you're using for vocals, and there are a lot out there. I mean, like I said, you pretty much can't find a microphone that's gonna be bad for vocals. They're pretty much all designed to to work with vocals in one way or another, but different microphones can work better for different applications. And this just kind of depends on the 
trial and error that you do. If you only have one microphone, then just get the most out of your one microphone. But maybe you have a, a choice. Maybe you have a microphone that you know is just really great for female vocals. It just really brings out something in the female voice versus another mic that's better for for the more mid-rangey male voice that has the uh, the more low end to it. That's something you should be aware of for your recording. Not every microphone is going to sound the same. Go listen to any microphone shootout on YouTube. You'll hear a lot of difference in the way that they sound, whether some boost the lows or accentuate uh, high frequency content or scoop the mids, boost the mids, do something. They, they, they all have their own little characteristics. And if you're recording yourself mostly, if it's mostly your own voice you're capturing, you you want to find a mic that's going to work best with your voice. Next is going to be your cables. These are going to be all over your signal path if you're using multiple devices. And when it comes to cables, uh, you know, you don't really have to spend a lot of money when it comes to the signal quality of cables. Pretty much any modern cable is going to be able to handle a signal and not give you a lot of problems. But there are a lot of options out there that are kind of more expensive than others. I mean, I remember back when monster cables were the thing and they had their gold plated, triple shielded diamond series, whatever, hundred dollar cable or whatever. That was just seemed kind of ridiculous. And there was a lot of argument over whether that was worth it or not, whether it actually made a difference in the sound quality. And there, there's a lot of, a lot of sides of that that argument you can read that make pretty good arguments. But my favorite story is one where uh, they took a group of, of audiophile types, people that were that were really into hi-fi audio gear for, for listening to audio, not necessarily for creating it, like vinyl enthusiasts and, and people like that. And they set up two identical systems, same speaker, same player, same preamp and, and all that, the, the, the hi-fi sort of system these guys would be into. And the only difference between the two systems one of them had all the nice, expensive, super fancy cables, and the other system was wired together with some old metal coat hangers that they had just welded together and created a, a, a chain. And in most cases, none of these audio files could tell the difference sound quality wise. Voltage is voltage in this situation. So you really don't have to spend a lot of money to get a cable that's gonna not give you a bad sound, or, or, or rather, you don't have to spend money to determine the, the sound quality of your cabling. Where that does come into play, however, is if you're in a touring situation, or you're doing a lot of moving around where you set up a rig, plug in thing, do a show, do a session, then tear it all down, pack it up, throw it in a truck and go somewhere else. If you're doing a lot of breaking down and setting up, that sort of wear and tear can make a difference on your cables. That's where it would be worth it to invest in a more, more heavy duty kind of cable, something that's uh, gonna be able to stand up to that kind of wear and tear more. But most of us are probably recording at home. We probably have a sort of static set up, one little corner of our room or whatever with a mic set up where we just, plug it in and that's our setup pretty much forever. If you're in that situation where you're just going to set it up once and leave it, don't don't uh, worry about spending a lot of money on on high-end cables. You can you can get away with decent quality stuff and uh, get the same results. That makes sense. Cool. All right, I kind of already went over uh, preamps and vocal chains. Just know that it is going to be part of your signal path. If you're plugging directly into an interface, you know, your interface is going to have a preamp built into it. If you're using a USB mic, it's going to have a preamp built into it. It might have some extra things built into it, like a compressor or some extra EQs or something. Those are all going to be separate components that are going to have their place in the path. It'll probably go like from the preamp to the compressor module to the EQ or maybe to the EQ to the compressor or something else. Just kind of know where uh, the signal is traveling from each point along that chain, whatever you're using. And since most of us are recording into computers, pretty much all of us, I'd say, before it hits the computer, it's got to enter a, a computer interface of some kind, an, an audio or sorry, an analog to digital conversion stage where it takes the analog signal the mic captures and converts it into the digital signal that the computer can use. Whether that happens in the mic, in the interface, whatever device, whether it's separate or part of, or a mod or a component within some larger device, that is sort of the on-ramp to getting into the computer. And then when you're monitoring out of the computer, sending a signal from your DAW 
or whatever piece of software to the monitors that are connected to your interface. It does the reverse process. It converts the digital signal into the analog signal and then pushes it out into uh, your speakers or headphones or whatever. So uh, be aware of that. Most of us, uh, again, are using probably like, like an all-in-one sort of USB interface or a USB mic that has several of these components all built into one, the mic, the preamp, the interface, and other devices. So just just be aware of it's not just one device. There are several things in, in that, that one piece of gear. And then once you get it into the computer, into whatever software you're using, know that your that piece of software is going to have its own internal signal flow where, where it brings in the signal and then maybe it hits a certain gain stage. Maybe it goes into a, a certain routing matrix where it can send the signal around. Maybe it hits things like an insert where you could put a plug in or an auxiliary send where you could send part of that signal to a different channel. Then it's going to hit things like maybe your panning control, your solo and mute controls before it gets to the channel fader where it sends that signal to the, the, the master stereo bus. These are all different virtual components inside the computer and the signal travels through each one of these. And again, it's important to know this because if you run into problems then and you have to track down where the signal is going, then knowing the path that it's taking, even within your DAW, can help you solve a lot of issues. And every DAW is going to have its own different way of handling the, the signal path and the signal flow. Usually you find that by looking up the documentation for that particular DAW. One that I suggest, even if you're not using it, it's kind of useful to see how it's done, is uh, check out Reaper at uh, reaper.fm if you're not aware of this, this tool. It's a, a full-fledged DAW that is freely available for anyone to try out. If you want to use it, you do. You are required to, to pay for it, but a personal license is only something like 60 bucks, so it's, it's very affordable. But if you just want to you know, download it and, and learn it and ch check out some of the things it can do, it's free to evaluate. And the documentation, the last time I checked, did have a full breakdown of the way the signal path works in it. If nothing else, it's very useful to check that out just so you can see the way signal path works within uh, a DAW, within a piece of software. Because again, that is uh, part of your overall signal path, and that's something you want to be aware of to um, track down problems, troubleshoot issues, things like that. The last thing I want to talk about in a signal path is if you are recording and monitoring at the same time, and who isn't if you're recording, then you're going to have two different paths you're working with. Your recording path is the signal path that happens from the source you're recording all the way to your recording destination. For most of us, that's a hard drive. So the signal goes from the microphone into the preamp, into the computer interface, all the way through your DAW until it gets written to your hard drive. That's your recording path. But we still want to be able to hear that, right? When we're recording. If you're a singer, you're going to be wearing headphones, so you uh, probably want to monitor that. You need a monitoring path so you hear what's being captured. The monitoring path can vary from DAW to DAW, but usually it starts right at the point the recording path ends, and then it will spit the signal back out of the DAW, back out of the interface, back out through the headphone port or whatever you're using, and get to the artist. The reason it's important to acknowledge these is because sometimes you can make use of that monitoring path to do some things you wouldn't otherwise be able to do in your recording path. Like here's an example. Let's say you're recording a singer that just really needs to hear reverb in their performance. That's a pretty common thing. Singers love reverb. It can just make them more comfortable, you know, with the sound of their voice and how they sing, and they can just get a better performance out of it. Well, you don't want to capture reverb. You can put any sort of reverb plug-in they want on it, but that might not necessarily be the sound you want what you're recording for you for your project. So you want to be able to capture this vocal dry without any effect but you want your singer, as they're singing, to be able to hear themselves through a reverb effect. How do you do that? You put that reverb effect in your monitoring path so that the signal path traveling to your recording medium doesn't touch it, doesn't get affected by any sort of uh, reverb. It's just uh, to the dry signal. But the signal that gets spit back out of the computer that gets spit back out of the interface into the, the what the singer is hearing, the, the headphones or whatever they're using, 
that will have the reverb effect in it so that they can hear the effect and they can get what they want to, for their performance. Everyone understand the difference there? There, There is a one a concerning point that comes up with that I will get into in the next slide, but I just want to make sure everyone understands the difference between recording path and monitoring path or, or any of the other things I've talked about as far as signal path goes. Does anyone have any questions regarding that? Yes. Sure. What's your question? Can I speak? Yeah, go ahead. In Logic, there's like an eye button that like reduces input monitoring. Uh -huh. So it wouldn't catch up any like audio when the audio channel is there, but you didn't add anything. Is there like, do you know if I could look up in the monitoring while I record with my microphone? Is there like for that? Or do I have to look at that? I'm not that familiar with Logic specifically to know the answer to that. But yeah, if you're, if you're looking for monitoring options, you're in the right place. The input monitoring is where you're going to find, find those kind of options. And I don't know exactly what the options are for Logic, but there can be different monitoring modes you can you can enable that will get different results depending on what you're trying to do. So uh, I can't answer your specific question, but I can tell you that you are looking in the right place. Thank you. Cool. All right. Uh, did anyone have any other questions? Okay, let's move on. Uh, let's talk about, you know, recording method. Once you've got uh, this going on or once you've got all of your stuff ready to go, how do you actually make use of it? What do you need to do to get a session started? Whenever you're building the session, the very first thing you need to consider for your, your DAW session is what are your digital audio sessions? settings. What is the bit rate, the sample rate, the buffer size you're going to be using? This is going to affect your, your the format of the file that you're recording to, and it's going to uh, affect the way your system is, is working as it's uh, capturing this audio. So a uh, bit rate in almost every case, and in fact, it's very rare that I use something other than 24 bit. 24 bit is pretty much all I ever use for anything. There are a, a few situations where I've had to deliver files in a 16 bit format, but I always recorded at 24 bit and then converted them down after the fact. So unless there's a very, very specific reason not to use 24 bit, I would say always use 24 bit. I just can't really think of a, a situation where you wouldn't want to record in that, even if you're going to end up using files that are less than 24 bit later. So yeah, 24 bit is pretty much a universal. A sample rate, that can vary a little bit. For most of my recording projects, I use a uh, 48K or 48,000 Hertz for my sample rate. And that's just sort of a minimum I set. Again, even if I'm gonna end up delivering something with a lower sample rate than that, I, I always record 48 or above just because that's sort of the minimum I set. And I think most uh, people these days are recording 2448 for most projects. The, a situation where I will go a little higher, like 96K, maybe even 192K if, if I like, is a situation where I intend on doing a, some extreme pitch shifting with, with that audio. Like if I plan on recording something and I want to be able to pitch it way down, then I'll record at a higher sample rate just because it's going to give me a better fidelity whenever I do that pitching work after the fact. But for music and most vocal performances, things like that, I will do 2448. Yep. Now buffer size, that is something that I change depending on whether I'm recording or mixing. A uh, buffer size, you can think of as kind of like a bucket. But when you're capturing audio, when you're recording audio coming into your computer, what's happening is you kind of have sort of like a two-man team working. You have one person that's holding a bucket and they're catching the audio as it comes in. That's the buffer. Whenever the buffer gets full, whenever the bucket gets full, he passes the bucket over to the next guy that's writing the information on the hard drive. And he's like, hey, here, here's all I can hold. You write this to the hard drive. And he passes that information over and then he goes back to catching more audio. So the buffer, the bucket guy is catching and passing, catching and passing, catching and passing. That's, that's what he does. Buffer size determines how big of a bucket that guy has. How much audio can he catch before he has to pass it to the next guy that's gonna write it to the hard drive. Now, this is important because depending on how much work he's doing, if he's got a small bucket, then he's gonna be doing a lot of work, catch and pass, catch and pass, catch and pass, yeah? If he's got a bigger bucket, it's not gonna be doing quite as much work. He's gonna catch some, catch some, catch some, then pass over the bigger load to the next guy, then go back to catch some, catch some, catch some, pass. The, the different situations where you wanna apply this is when you're recording, 
You want a small bucket. You want the guy passing the information really fast, as fast as he can get it, because that just makes for a smoother recording process, but it's gonna work your computer more. So if you're using a lot of plugins, like, like remember the monitoring path situation, if you were using some really high-end reverb plugin that's just really using up a lot of CPU, those two things can kind of work against each other. So ideally the best recording is when you have a small buffer size, but when you're in a mixing situation where you want to use lots of plugins, lots of extra processing power, you don't want the bucket guy eating up all of your CPU. So you give him a bigger bucket so he's not doing as much work so your CPU can do more of the work of your plugins crunching those numbers for reverbs and delays and stuff like that. Does that make sense to everybody? Really the important thing is remember is when you're recording, try to have a small buffer size, something like 128, maybe 256 if you need to go that high. But whenever you're mixing, you want a higher buffer size, like 512, somewhere around that. That's the settings I usually use. I mean, your, your settings may vary depending on your particular system. But just know that's what the buffer's doing, and that's the situation where you'd want a large buffer size versus a small buffer size. Everybody cool with that? All right. Next is, uh, are you recording mono, mono or stereo? We're almost always recording mono with vocals, right? Because, hey, we got one voice. It's uh, one source. But as we add different effects and things, reverb, maybe a chorus effect, something like that, then uh, that can lead to a stereo output. So you can start off with a mono source and end up with a stereo result. Just be aware of that if you're going to be using those kind of effects that you can end up with multiple channels or, or, or you can end up with a stereo version of something that started off as a mono channel uh, source. Yeah, okay. And one thing you, you probably want to avoid is there can be a situation where you end up with two channels of the same information. It's called dual mono. And depending on your particular DAW, sometimes you can record a, a mono vocal that'll get captured that way. It's not, not, it's not really a problem if you had to deal with it, but it, it can create some bigger files and some extra information you probably don't want to deal with. So, so just be aware of the whole mono versus stereo thing when dealing with uh, vocals. Uh, does recording in mono change the timbre? No, no, because you'd be recording a mono source. So recording a mono source in mono isn't going to change anything. Recording a mono source in stereo, if you we're using true stereo miking, that would sound a little different. But if you end up with the dual mono thing, really all that's going to do is kind of boost the signal because you've got two channels of the same information that's just stacked on top of each other. So you just end up with sort of a louder, a louder sound. Next, let's talk about a uh, noise floor. Pretty much every recording has some amount of noise floor in it. That can be very loud or very quiet, depending on where you record the source and how you record it. But uh, just be aware of it at the point you're recording, because if you you have something like a hum that you can hear in the gear something, something you're going to have to deal with later. Maybe don't boost the signal so loud that that, that uh, noise floor becomes a problem. Try to keep your noise floor as low as possible as opposed to your vocal content. Because you can always uh, use uh, noise reduction to kind of get rid of that uh, noise floor. There's lots of uh, different softwares out there that, that can get rid of a noise floor from your recording. Uh, but yeah, just be aware of it. Don't, don't crank the gain on something so much that it sounds like a... Marshall amplifier stack when you're when you're not actually using the microphone. Oh, uh, and since we're talking about that, let's talk about gain structure. Whether you're using a really complicated vocal chain or not, with a lot of pieces of gear in between your your microphone, your recording medium, like a preamp, a compressor, EQ, maybe like a, some plugins or whatnot. Every device is going to have some amount of uh, boosting or reduction it does to the signal, lowers it a little bit or raises it a little bit, and then it may give you uh, controls that let you boost or lower it a lot. And know that whenever you make a change on one piece of gear, it's going to affect the signal going into every other piece of gear down the line. So if you end up at the end of your chain, you've got you know something that's too quiet or too loud, you're going to have to backtrack the signal into every device and say like, okay, how loud is this device making the signal? Okay, this looks good. Let me go back to this one. What's happening here? And you trace back until you find the problem. Like, oh, oh here it is. For Somehow this gain got turned up way too loud or way too quiet. 
so you can make the adjustment there. So yeah, know that every device, even if it doesn't give you a gain control, is going to have some type of gain staging into it, maybe at the input or the output point that it does that can affect the the overall volume level of your signal. And know about your monitoring sources. If you're putting effects on there, you might run into some latency. Remember I talked about the monitoring path, the way that uh, the signal, the vocalist sings into the microphone, the signal goes from the microphone into the preamp, through the interface, into the computer, hits the recording medium, it gets captured. When it comes back out of the monitoring source, if you've got a lot of plugins or effects, reverb, delay, a chorus or whatever, well, computers aren't like analog gear. Analog gear is pretty much instantaneous with the way it delivers signal, but computers have to crunch numbers. They got to do some calculations and that can take a little bit of time. And all of that time can add up to microseconds of delays in the signal coming out of the monitoring path. If you have too much happening in that monitoring path, too much crunching going on, it's going to delay the signal too much. And what the singer hears is going to be just slightly off from what they're singing. And they can kind of have that, that echo effect that you hear in headphones sometime. That's what that's coming from. That's latency. That's a, that's a delay that's happening in the processing of the signal. How do you eliminate that? Well, you have to start to take off some of those effects and uh, reducing the workload on your computer. Sometimes the DAW will have a uh, delay compensation built into it so that it can sort of automatically adjust the way that signal's coming in and going out so you don't have that effects. But uh, yeah, if, you're, if you don't have those kind of options, then you just have to sort of try to reduce the CPU load as much as possible or try to work with your buffer size, see if you can tweak that a little bit, just do whatever you can to try to try to get that delay out of there because your singer's not gonna like hearing that. That's gonna sound strange to them. It's gonna throw off their performance and uh, create issues for you. And lastly, when you're recording, just know about things like proximity effect and plosives and sibilance. These are things that are gonna be coming from your, uh, from your singer, from your vocalist. Proximity effect happens whenever you get really close to the mic. The closer you get to the mic, the bassier your voice will get. Sometimes this is a desirable effect, but sometimes it can cause problems. So just know that whatever your singer dealing with, if you don't wanna have to deal with this, Make sure you let them know, okay, don't get that close to the mic and know your mic. When, How close can you get to the mic without having this effect become a problem? If you look in the example there, there's a pop filter set up, so the singer can't get that close to the mic, but the engineer might have uh, purposefully set it up that way to avoid something like the proximity. Or in the opposite situation, maybe you want proximity effect. Maybe you really want to get as close to the mic as you can, baby, and get that very wide effect. That can be a desirable thing, so just know how to do that with your particular mic and work uh, with your singer on that effect. Uh, the next thing to be aware of is plosives. What's a plosive? Well, certain words, mainly words that start with uh, letter P as in Paul or letter B as in Brian, those create little puffs of air that happen whenever we pronounce those. And those puffs of air can hit a microphone diaphragm really hard and create a, a sort of distorted bassy sound. So puff the plosive into the microphone. It has a positively pounding, impactful plosive sound. I ran out of P words, but you get the idea. To deal with that, that's where you want a pop filter coming in. You want something that can help filter out some of that little explosive air so it doesn't hit the microphone so hard. That's what a plosive is. And lastly, let's talk about sibilance. What is sibilance? Sibilance is the sort of high frequency shrilly sound that comes with S words. Like when you say hiss or kiss or censorship. Those kind of C words or S sound create just a little too much shrill in, in some people's voices. And you've got to deal with that. It's called sibilance. And there are special tools that are made for dealing with it called de-essers. And it's sort of like a special EQ that will zero in on the sibilance frequency of a particular singer and let you reduce just that while leaving the other, leaving the rest of the performance intact. So know about uh, proximity effect, plosives, and sibilance. Does anyone have any questions on uh, this before we move forward? All right, next up, let's talk about editing. Once you have your, your session recorded, what do you do with it? How do you start editing to different takes and comping them and stuff like that? Well, what I like to do is first and foremost is make a copy of it. That is 
just having an original raw untouched copy that I'm not going to edit. I'm not going to change. And most, most DAWs do have non-destructive editing. That is you can record something and you can chop it up and rearrange it without actually changing the source file. But you know, some tools don't have that. Like two-track editors, a lot of times will just save the file as is. So if you're editing anything like this, I just like to make sure I have an unedited copy in case, oh, I made a mistake. So I can go back to the very beginning, to the untouched version and start all over. And maybe I'll do that uh, by having like one DAW session I record in and another one I edit in. Or maybe I'll have the recorded uh, file on one track and I'll make a duplicate of that track and I'll edit the duplicate. So I always have that untouched version. That's just just me sort of like, you know, a little uh, CY for whenever I might make a mistake and need to go back to the untouched version. So I recommend keeping uh, an original copy of whatever you record, however you do that. So what's the first thing you want to do whenever you actually start editing? The first thing I recommend doing is do your cleanup work first. If you need to do any noise reduction or any sort of EQ work or compression that needs to be applied to the entire recording, do that before you start chopping it up because that way you're only doing it once. If you end up editing your recording session into 10 different takes, you don't want to have to do 10 different noise reductions, 10 different EQs, 10 different this or that. Just do it once and then start chopping it up. So uh, you'll save yourself some work. So uh, after the cleanup, that's when you start cutting things into your different different sections. When you do your cut and comp, if you look at the example there, uh, three different uh, takes were recorded, and this person is chopping up the various sections they're going to use, like they're using the first section of take one, they're using the second section of take two, then they go back up to take one, then they take a chunk out of take three. They're assembling the best parts of each one of these takes into one master take, into one compilation, one, one compiled take. That is what it means to, to comp something. And that way you get the best parts out of uh, each one of your vocal takes. Now, once you have uh, that done, that's pretty much editing in a nutshell. Once you have uh, all of that done, then you're gonna move on to processing it. When you have your final take ready, that's when you start doing your more focused dynamics processing. You're, you're doing more a focused EQ, more purposeful compression on certain parts versus maybe not certain, maybe not on other parts, any type of, any other type of dynamics work, saturation, whatever. This is where you're going to save that work for your final take, because this is going to be probably a lot more work, a lot more involved, a lot more tedious. And again, you don't want to have to do that 10 different times for 10 different takes wait until you have your final compiled take and then save all the work for that. But once you have it shaped as far as your EQ and your compression and all that, then you can start adding in your modulation and your sort of prettying effects. Pretty much every vocal these days has some amount of reverb on it. So that's pretty much a given. Most common way is using an auxiliary send and whatever reverb you're using, it doesn't really matter the, the plugin or the type of hall versus a, a room or you know something like that. It just depends on your particular project, but, but you can add that in. And then other things like delay, that's another thing that's pretty common amongst vocal production. You can add a delay on it virtually the same way. You can add plugins directly on like your vocal track and use like a wet dry control to control the signal. Uh, that's another way you can do it. it. It doesn't really matter whichever way you want to use them um, and that gets the results you want. And then there's some other things like uh, you know, chorus effects or flange. Those are common modulation effects you find on, on vocal performances that also fall sort of in the same category as the reverb and delay. A little more rare, or I, I guess I'd say a little more specialized. But the last category, special effects, that's things like the auto-tune kind of effect. Not auto-tune as a, as a corrective tool, but auto-tune as a special effect, like trap music or the T-Pain effect. People are actually like using it to an extreme so that you notice it, so it's not just fixing a mistake, or, or, or extreme uh, pitch shifting style effects. Those are things that I usually say for last after I've got it shaped out, got it sitting in a nice space with reverb and delay, and then you can throw in uh, all those special effects on it. But really, there's no rule. You can, you can do that uh, in any order you want to, whatever gets you the best result and uh, whatever uh, fits best in your mix. And with that, that kind of brings everything to a conclusion as far as our vocal uh, production lecture. Does anyone have any questions or anything else you wanted me to go over before we call it? Is there like any advanced tips you can give us, like, like any holy grail tips that will make it better? 
or do you think this would be enough? Well, it depends on what you're doing. If if you're talking about like a vocal performance for music, the best advice I can get is just try to make it sit in your mix as as best as it can. Man, there's there's nothing that ruins a good vocal more than when it's too loud or too quiet or it, it has a certain frequency content that clashes with the the instrumental or something yeah like i i notice a lot of a lot of like pop music the vocals are kind of too loud and i know they want the vocal to stand out but sometimes it just stands out too much and it it sounds it sounds like karaoke to me, you know, it sounds like the music is so far in the back, it might as well not even matter. So that's something I personally like to hear is a vocal that's sitting properly in the mix and not too loud, not too quiet. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? Oh yeah, sure. You talked about earlier with uh, the pop filter. I use a pop filter, but I find my voice can be particularly sharp, not even with my S's. Like lately, I've been having a problem with some of my G's. My G's can have that same kind of pop that you don't want. And okay. a DS or I don't think would work something that's not an S sound. So do you have any recommendations uh, around that? Oh. Well, well, just to be clear, you're, you're talking about sibilance with the S sounds, but a pop filter is more for the plosive issue. So... Are you talking about both plosives and sibilants or just sibilants? Okay. Well, as far as the plosives go, I would just say maybe maybe look at getting a better pop filter or getting a second pop filter because some of them are actually kind of crappy. Like I actually use two on on my main vocal my my main vocal mic. I've got this uh, mesh sort of I don't know like a pantyhose kind of material one, and then I've got an actual metal one. And I just stack those two on top of each other. And that does a pretty good job of handling plosive issues for me. Whereas just the mesh one wasn't doing it. And I didn't really like just using the metal one. I thought it kind of sounded weird. So sometimes you just got to combine them. Sometimes you just got to find the right one for the plosive issue. For the sibilance, if your voice just has a quality that that make certain S sounds or even G sounds or whatever stand out like that, then you just got to got to learn your voice and know what you got to do after the fact and so you would record your voice either as is or you would put an eq in your in your uh, vocal chain or even a ds in your vocal chain to handle that sort of shrillness as you're recording or deal with it after the fact i like dealing with stuff after the fact i, I prefer recording something raw and then going in and try to do those uh, types of fixes after the fact because again, if I get it wrong, I can always redo the fix. If I record with something in the path, then I'm committing to that sound and I can't go back and un-EQ it once it's recorded. That makes sense? Yeah, that makes sense. Thank you. I got yeah. uh, Again, it's just, you just got to do trial and error, record your voice, whatever normal singing style you do or speaking style and try to purposefully, well, maybe not purposefully do those, but, but do sing lines or, or speak lines where you would where you would have sibilance issues and then go in and try to fix it after the fact and see what you got to do eq wise to get those sounds out with either a, an eq or an or a ds or effect and just sort of practice on your own voice and once you get good at it then it won't really be an issue you just you just sort of know like oh okay i just need to adjust this one frequency and it's good where's the best db you think your vocals should sit at the best vocal level or i mean sorry yeah, the vocal. best the decibel level yeah decibel level man i never really thought of it like that i mean i really don't think about decibel level until i'm doing the final mix and then i'm just thinking about you know sort of like the main output not necessarily individual uh sounds i don't know if i've ever mixed a vocal where i specifically knew the db it was sitting at maybe i should have been all this time but i, I just kind of play it by ear again it, it it's kind of different for different projects, I think, but maybe there's a uh, a more educated opinion that would tell you, oh, it should be like between negative 12 or negative 18 or something like that. But I, I really couldn't say. Oh, here's Magic chiming in. He'll know. Okay. DB shouldn't matter when tracking vocals. Oh, yeah. When when tracking, just don't get it too hot. You, you can adjust after the fact. Back in the old days when people were recording to analog tape, they would record a little hot because you wanted to hit that tape kind of hard because analog tape had a natural compression to it. And if you hit it kind of hard, you would it would naturally compress your sound. But digital isn't like that. If you clip digital, it's not going to sound anything but bad. So you want to you want to make sure that you're you're not recording at a level that is uh, that is clipping or creating any sort of distortion. Hey, I got a question. 
Sure. What, what's that? What are some determining factors whether you would or would not use a take? I mean, that's uh, really up to the artist or the producer. For me, I'm going to kind of pay attention to the articulation of the words, maybe. And if there's something that sounds funny that I don't like, or maybe maybe it sounds interesting. Sometimes, you know, a mispronounced word can make a hit. But I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to pay attention to things like articulation, did someone flub the end of the word or they didn't quite pronounce the whole thing or it sounded funny or maybe they definitely if they got off off key, that would be a factor. But there's not there's not like a list of criteria I go through. It's got to match this, this, this and this. I just sort of listen to it. If it sounds good, it sounds good. If it if there's a problem, then do another take or try to try to fix the, what, you, what I don't like about that take. Thank you. And that kind of leads me on to another question. So. <laughs> We got these plugins that have really good tracking for pitch. So if someone sings out a pitch, is it worth saving it with um, these plugins or would you rather just get a, a clean take with, with someone sings it right? I mean, I think most people are going to tell you you'd always rather have a good take. Engineers and producers will, will tell you, you know, the idea of fix it in post or fix it in the mix almost never comes out uh, the way you would you would expect it to uh, you, you don't you don't really get good results when you just think like oh we can just fix it with tools well think about it like this a, a cruise ship has lifeboats but they don't really intend to use them right it's just sort of in an emergency situation they're there in case something goes wrong that's, that's sort of the analogy. same way yeah that's the sort of the same way i look at those tools you don't don't set sail with the idea that oh we're going to end up on these lifeboats before it's over have the lifeboats just in case but go in with the plan that we're not going to use them because we're not going to need them because everything is going to go right and we'll get what we want out of the, the crews not have to jump in the lifeboats 